Hey booktube, it's Angie. So this is the video that I said I was going to film last night, but as you can see, <laughs> different outfit, edition of natural light now. Yeah, when I started to film this video last night, for some reason, my camera decided to just close up shop and go home for the night. Couldn't get it to, I could get it to turn on, but do no, absolutely nothing else. It was responding to nothing, so after about, <laughs> an hour or so messing with it and getting nowhere, I figured sometimes you just have to cut your losses and start again in the morning, right? So so that's that's why this didn't get up last night. But let's talk some more of the roses, right? <laughs> received yeah, some ebooks of War of the Roses and War of the Roses, the sequel, The Children, from Warren Adler's publicity company. It's Stonehouse Publishing, I believe. Warren Adler is doing, well, I don't know if he's still doing it, but he was doing, a, I think he was calling it the Book Bonanza giveaway, where he was putting it out there for book bloggers that if they wanted to, he was offering them free copies of his books for honest reviews to get the word out about his works again and to bring attention to them because a number of his books are becoming movie adaptations in 2015 and 2016 so it's good publicity <laughs> he did say he wanted honest reviews so, so here we go he he had a whole list of ones you could pick from i ended up picking War of the Roses and the sequel War of the Roses Children because those were the ones that I was most familiar with and were probably closest to m my interests. And I remember watching the movie when I was about, I think I was about 15 the first time I saw the movie. <laughs> I, was, I was terrified thinking, dear God, is that what marriage is gonna be like? <laughs> it was a little bit bizarre seeing it and thinking that that's what I had to look forward to <laughs> and then I didn't at the time up until this this book giveaway I didn't even know there was a book attached to the movie so when I found out of course I immediately jumped on it and because I wanted to see how the book played out it, it was great it was <laughs> not what I was well I knew kind of what I was going into because I had seen the movie, but there were a number of changes made between the book and the movie. So I definitely recommend looking at both. If you're not familiar, the book and the movie were both made back in the, the early 80s. And it's the story of Barbara and Oliver, who uh, initially meet up as college age people who uh, get summer jobs. I think they end up getting summer jobs on Cape Cod and they meet up at this auction house on Cape Cod and there are these two boxer figurines. Oliver, he's familiar with them. He knows that they're supposed to go together, but for some reason the auction house decides they're going to sell them separately. And so Barbara comes in and she bids on one, he bids on the other, and then he tracks her down after the auction and says no they should really stay together and this whole conversation starts up and it's the beginning of this this great romance in the beginning and then in the book we I think it's right into chapter two it fast forwards a good bit in into their relationship and we see that they're married they have kids and the kids are one is 12 one is 16 and then they bring in a 22 year old au pair which I thought was a little odd, but uh, it makes sense when they start to mention that Barbara wants to start up a catering company, and I could see that that would, that would be a little bit overwhelming to try to start up a business and try to keep everything in the house at the same time. So it's no, no sin to ask for help. It is a sin for your au pair to lust after your husband the way that Anne does, but that all plays into the story and gets into the grit of everything. And so it's at this point that we see uh, Barbara, she's, she's starting up this catering company. The kids are doing well in school. They seem to have this great structure. Um, Oliver has become a really 
successful lawyer. They have this beautiful home filled with all these amazing antiques. You think everything is going great. And then one day at work, Oliver, he has what he thinks is a heart attack and gets rushed to the hospital, begging for his wife the whole way, understandably. And then <laughs> he, it turns out he's fine. He, it is something much more minor. And so he gets back home and obviously wants to talk to his wife, say, uh, b why were you not there? <laughs> and she basically tells him, I didn't feel like coming. I just, uh, mm, no, I mean, I figured you were gonna be fine. You're fine, look at you, you're home now, it's great. And she just, her whole demeanor in the story all of a sudden just flips. And he doesn't get it because he's going along thinking everything is great, he had the perfect family, and then it, it's just, it's, not a hundred percent clear what happens to Barbara and maybe that is part of the tension that works in the stories. You don't really totally know why she flips the way she does but all of a sudden her thinking about her marriage it just completely does a 180 and there's a scene where she's she's fixing a meal for one of her catering clients and it just strikes her out of the blue I loathe my husband I see like every single thing about him just annoys me to no end and I want him to not be around me anymore <laughs> and for even for the reader it's like what what <laughs> and then that starts the the derailing train that is the Rose marriage all of a sudden she goes to him and says yeah yeah I want a divorce I do and of course he's sitting there going what the fuck <laughs> and i i feel for him i do because i was doing the same thing going she not only asks for a divorce she puts it out there that he he needs to leave the house immediately he does and on top of that she intends to take everything because she feels it's owed to her for as she puts it, she sees that she gave up everything, her career and everything that could have happened in her life to marry him and have his kids. And now she feels like he owes her for sacrificing that much, which even as a woman, that drove me crazy because I'm like, you made a choice. You can't, you can't get married and then hold that against your spouse that you gave that up. You decided to do that so that bugged me and it's just crazy how they turn on each other and it's just it's the story starts off kind of slow and it and you can feel when you're reading it, it starts picking up speed little by little and then you get to a point where they just both start losing it and they both start getting petty and just dangerous Oliver starts out as the nice guy he's like I want everything to be fair if she doesn't want to stay around at least let's make this amicable and <laughs> and she's just Barbara's just like screw that I'm taking everything take him down it's bizarre because even Barbara at one point in the story she she goes back and forth on her on her reasoning I think there's a point where she calls her mother to explain that she's leaving her husband and her mother even asks her well what happened did he cheat on you anything like that and she <laughs> explains no he's been great he's been a really supportive father and, and uh, he's been a really great provider and husband and um, you know he's he's been really supportive of me starting my own company he was the one that encouraged me to do it <laughs> and of course her mom's like what's the problem she's like I just I don't know I just I yeah, he makes me sick <laughs> especially when her her behavior just turns more and more icy and venomous it starts to wear down on Oliver to where he starts to pick up that behavior and he starts to turn that way on her he gets to where he's like you know what you're right let's just get down and dirty about this and so they both just turn psycho they booby trap the house to try to to harm and potentially murder each other 
they poison food, they take it out on the pets and the plants to get back at each other, they smash each other's belongings, and it just gets dark, <laughs> like really dark. And it's a lot of fun though, because I, I there's a sick, twisted part of me that gets entertainment out of it, especially when there is dark humor written in, which this one does have. It's it's subtle, but it is in there. And so I, I really enjoyed that part of it, and it really does show just how crazy people can get attached to things. That's the the thought that's running through your head as the reader, when they get as deeply into it as they do, you can't forget that it's, it's just stuff. Stuff. I mean, <laughs> the way I look at it, I'm, I'm a book blogger. You guys have seen the stacks of my books around here. I would be devastated if I lost all my books. But if somebody came to me and said, you can sacrifice your books or your husband, Without a doubt, I would save my husband. Hands down, wouldn't even think about it because I can replace books all day. Give me a reason to go on a book haul. <laughs> I can't replace my husband. And so that's why the, the thought kind of stunned me. And I will say, I watched the movie again right after I finished this novel and it was the first time I had watched the movie since getting married. And it was a little tense and bizarre, <laughs> but kind of funny to sit there and watch it with my husband because we were just looking at each other, shaking our heads and then making jokes about like, don't be taking notes, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. But ugh, yeah, those two, crazy, crazy. But d yes, definitely check this one out. It's a lot of fun. If you like like tense psychological stories with dark humor thrown in and <laughs> if you like stories about divorces gone bad if that's your thing this one's definitely for you <laughs> the other thing I will mention about this book real quick before I go into the other one I did notice but I noticed last night that some of the earlier editions have Oliver Rose written in as Jonathan so if you see that I think that was a, a change that was made later <laughs> because I went to um check something on Amazon, on the Amazon listing. And when I looked at the, I think it was in the preview option, when you click on the book, it popped up and, it's, and it opens with Jonathan Rose. And I was thinking, who the hell is Jonathan? So yeah, just FYI, I think the name was changed later on. War of the Roses, The Children. There is a sequel. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think there may be a movie version of this coming out next year, possibly, but I could be wrong on that, so don't hold me to that. War of the Roses, the children, uh, meets back up with Josh and Evie, who are Barbara and Oliver's kids from the first book. And I initially thought it was going to start almost immediately after the end, but this one actually picks up years later. Josh and Evie are already well out of college. They're married now. Well, Josh is married to a lawyer, oddly enough. <laughs> and Evie is not, but Evie is the, the doting aunt. And this one really shows how the divorce and the subsequent <laughs> implosion and all that, it how it affected them psychologically and how it the internally scarred them and sort of remolded their personalities and their character. So in Josh's instance, Josh, or Josh was the younger one. Uh, in Josh's case, he became, he sort of became very obsessed with like damage control almost. He wanted, he wants everything to be in a contained state. He wants order. He married this woman, Victoria, who also came from a different kind of broken home, but a similar type of uh, trauma in, in a way. And between the two of them, when they have their kids, they 
set up this family that's very rigid, very rule oriented, and there are no, they're not allowed to be any secrets between anybody. You stick to your schedules, you excel at school. It's all about rules and school and being the best of everything. And there are no, there doesn't seem to be any like real indulgences in that house. It's just, you eat food for fuel and it's, I don't know, it just seems very structured and not very kid friendly. Well, on the other hand, Evie sort of, <laughs> she, she internalized her trauma in a different way. She became very food oriented to the point of where Victoria refers to her as gluttonous and obese and, uh, you know, she thinks that she's a joke as a woman and an embarrassment and, you know, there's all these comments about how she can't stop stuffing her face. And the reality behind that is that's how Evie deals with the, the dark that's in her head. She remembers her mom being a caterer. She remembers the house being full of cooking smells and so she uses she goes and learns all her mom's old recipes and she uses the recipes to remember better times in her family because <laughs> once you read the first one if you're those two kids you would not want to remember that ending you would want to remember the good holidays and when things were great so i can understand evie wanting to attach herself to things that are happy <laughs> considering you no know, how her parents' relationship ended. Nobody, nobody wants that visual. So she sort of luxuriates in all these really rich recipes. She does a lot of French cooking with heavy sauces and oh, she <laughs> gets very Julia Child, like butter everything. <laughs> and it's her way of showing love and happiness and friendship. And she encourages that with everyone else at one point that creates a riff between her and Josh's wife because somehow Josh's wife takes that as an attack on her mothering or her family. So that turns into a big thing and then there's this whole <laughs> candy bar fiasco that happens with uh, Matthew's son which uh, I, don't know, I thought was a little crazy in the story that thinking that this that something so small could create such a drama within a home and school life but I don't have kids so maybe that is a reality but I don't know it seemed a bit much to me for parents to go ballistic over somebody's kid bringing handy bars to school anyway so yeah Josh and Victoria are trying to be the uber parents and Evie's just trying to be the happy, doting aunt who, who, you know, just wants to ply people with really good food and snuggles and just, I think she's mainly just trying to put the trauma in the back of her mind and sort of just sweep it under the rug and say, let's just not think about it. <laughs> and I don't know, so, everyone, so everyone's in their own sort of world of denial, which ends up being its own sort of uh, implosion or history sort of repeats itself from book one because Victoria there's something that happens that Josh feels he needs to come clean about and he he thinks you know it'll be good because they've built this house around no lies no secrets and everything and so she'll appreciate that he's coming forward and everything will be good and so he comes forward and she's quiet for a minute and then says I want a divorce <laughs> and so you sort of imagine all of book one happening over again but thankfully they don't go that dark um, they they take it a different route and in one way it's a little bit more mature but then in another way it still sounds kind of petty the way they go but reading between the two uh, Josh and Victoria I mean I've never been divorced myself, but I've seen a number of my friends get divorced and I've, 
I personally have never experienced, at least viewing them, I've never experienced a totally amicable divorce. There's always some underhandedness somewhere between somebody. And thinking that, I thought Josh and Victoria had a more realistic uh, visual of what most divorces probably go down like now. But I understood why it was so extreme in the first book because it, the point was to to illustrate not being attached to things so much and how how dangerous that can be. <laughs> I just thought it was funny that Victoria brings out the same argument that Barbara did from the first book where she says, you know, I've, I've given up everything for you. I gave up my career. I had your kids. You owe me. <laughs> and again, I'm thinking, nobody owes you. You made a choice. If you, and I know this is the age of the rebirth of feminism and um, you know, I know there's there's probably a few militant feminists that might see this and be like, oh, no, no, he does owe her. But I'm sorry, I just feel like you gotta be you. If you wanna if you wanna be a career woman and a mom, you gotta figure that out for yourself. If you get married, you made that choice. Your spouse doesn't owe you to pay you back for marrying them. So I don't know. I just get. It's one of my peeves when people go into relationships and they go very tit for tat and tally marks like 50-50 all the way down the middle because it just doesn't strike me as realistic. It's just, yes, there's got to be give and take and there's got to be compromise and stuff, but you shouldn't have a tally sheet through your relationship. That's just crazy. I could see behind it that, that Victoria was a good mom and uh, Josh is a good dad. It's just somewhere along the lines their communication got lost and Victoria didn't feel like it could ever be regained. Her her basis for divorce was a little bit more understandable given what Josh is confessing. But still to to get as bitter as she was. You know, it's a novel. It's meant novels are meant to be a little bit blown out of proportion to sort of have us look inside ourselves and think, God, yeah, you don't want to go there. <laughs> While the divorce process is going on, there's also Victoria battling with Mr. Tatum, who is the principal at her son's school. Her son is having a little bit of a behavioral issue through much of the novel. And m at one point, Mr. Tatum comes forward and basically blackmails Victoria into uh, agreeing to provide him with sexual favors in order to keep her son from being expelled. And I was just stunned that she would even consider going along with this because, oh God, I needed such a good scrub after reading Mr. Tatum. He was just all kinds of skeevy, dirty, ugh, ugh, <laughs> and just ugh. Even thinking about it now, I'm just ugh. <laughs> and I don't know, I just, I was just telling my husband that if I was put in that situation, I just, I wanted to shake Victoria because I felt like she kind of took the easy way out and said, oh yeah, you know, I'll just go along with it. No, you don't go along with it. <laughs> you fight dirtier. At least that's the way I was raised. Somebody fights you, you fight dirtier. You come back, you know. A little bit more underhanded if it comes to that when it comes to people threatening your children and your family then you know in our family anyway that kind of makes that usually means you know <laughs> civility is out the window if you come at the family but yeah I didn't really agree with how she dealt with him but I could understand why she did it but still ugh, ugh, I just felt so dirty after those two but <laughs> I did feel for her though. I, for a lot of the novel, I didn't really feel for Victoria and I did kind of feel for her near the end when what she does comes out and she has to deal with the shame of that. And uh, somehow her son finds out about it and he looks at it differently and says, 
well, you know, I, I wanted to show people that you were a good mom and, and you were willing to sacrifice for me. And no, <laughs> I was not expecting the son to come out and say that because he's still pretty young to have to uh, process what she did. And somehow he comes out being one of the most mature characters in the whole book, even though he's a little kid, basically. <laughs> and it's a shame because there's also Victoria's mother, who is a special kind of man-hater. There's just, I don't know what happened to that woman to make her that. That's, that's a whole nother level of bitter. Because um, there's nothing that changes her mind about anything. She just, she just hates men all around. There's nothing any of them can do to impress her. They're all untrustworthy, unreliable dirt bags all the time. Doesn't matter who they are. They're gonna turn on you at some point. And she feeds this venom into Victoria and even her grandchildren. And there's something that happens with the son, uh, with Victoria's son, where they're really scared that he's gonna be hurt, that he might have his life threatened. And even then the grandmother is like, well, you know, serves him right for doing what he did. <laughs> Just like, it, even, even when your grandson is in a life-threatening situation still, even then, really? And there was something about her that struck me as very reminiscent of the grandmother from V.C. Andrews' uh, Flowers in the Attic not in violence, just in her bitter tone that never lets up. I just kept picturing that grandmother from Flowers in the Attic. Just, I felt like she could get physically violent at any point, but yeah, the evil of that woman. So the first book illustrates the dangers of putting your importance and your love so heavily into material possessions rather than family and emotional bonds that you know can actually last <laughs> as opposed to material stuff that can go up in one good fire. <laughs> so that's kind of what the first book focuses on. I think the second book with the children that focuses more on how the choices of one generation can trickle down into the next one or the next several generations and how Basically, the, the actions of one generation can go ahead and fuck up <laughs> the whole family tree if, if they let it and uh, shows that families can wait generations for there to be one generation of the tree to just stop and say, this is stupid. You, you need, our family needs to grow up already. People are getting hurt. People are getting killed. This is stop. Just stop. And I could relate to that because there's there's elements of that in my own family where uh, their generations back, people made really stupid decisions that are still causing feuds in my family even now that people will not let go of. And it has caused a whole branch of my own family to be really bitter against another branch in my own family. So yeah, I could, what is that saying? The sins of the father kind of thing. I, so yeah, I got that. And I thought that was a really cool message to sort of seep in there and get people thinking about between the two of them. I think I was, I was trying to decide, I, I think the children uh, War of the Roses the Children. I think that one moved a little bit faster for me, but when I got to the end of it, I realized I kind of missed some of the drama that happened in the first book. I felt like I was more entertained by Barbara and Oliver's story than with Josh and Victoria's story. And, but I really loved Evie and there are a number of characters in both books that I really enjoyed. So I do recommend reading this whole duology. They're both really short books. I think 
both books were under 250 pages. They're really fast reads. Warren Adler has a style of writing that's very short sentences, very quick dialogue. Even the longer paragraphs are, are only maybe three or four sentences put together. So it, it reads really fast and it's just a fun time all around and there's a lot of good stuff to think about that <laughs> well, maybe if you have a feud going on in your family, it will maybe make you reconsider and think, you know what, maybe we can put this behind us already because, yeah, it's it's not worth bringing down the house. It's not. So yeah, I definitely recommend these and, and definitely check out the movie as sort of a, a supplement. The movie, like I said, the there were some changes made, but I think if you take everything as a whole, it's a really fun, entertaining package that you will get a lot of uh, emotional enjoyment out of and a lot of, uh, just a lot of food for thought, really. I mean, <laughs> it's, the, the, this, this novel has lasted through generations already, so obviously there is something in there that speaks to people even now, so go check it out. Alright guys, that's all I have for today. I will see you soon. Bye.